Do you two have any pets that sometimes jump in on your virtual conversations? Not me. There you go. I, I did. I, I used to use our dog, uh, particularly when she was a puppy, when I was, I was doing the Zoom mates call. So I was calling in during COVID um, in between the window therapy times. And our dog used to feature heavily in meeting the elders um, and joining our conversations, uh, which was really fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was very There are times when I'm more tolerant. I don't want the dog to bark because then I have to Uh, mute out or something like that. But half the time I leave the cat wandering around and the dog is under my desk on my toes uh, because 9 a.m. in the morning just seems to be a very quiet, relaxing time. It closes the windows so that there's no beeping of trucks or barking of dogs. And um, But sometimes, and I've said this probably twice now on, on um, live stream, that there was one day that I specifically chose people who live in different time zones around the planet So I did have a different person in Malaysia who said, I did something new today. I put on my makeup at midnight for (laughs) this show. And I I hear that it's good as you age to to try new things. So she was quite animated and excited. And I thought, hoy, what is she going to be like tomorrow? And the cat jumps up. And here we are just going in and out of beautiful dialects and people talking about their their backgrounds of of people and it was all because it was in march was international women's day so i was i had people around the planet and up jumps the cat and i hear this kitty and i'm going oh (laughs) no it sounds the same in every accent (laughs) (laughs) So and came true. and was, you know, the tails going back and forth during it. And I thought, this is just, this is just fun. I was grateful that so many of those people were willing to jump in on, on that, that day. It made it exciting for me. And yes, we talked about aging. I love it when people talk about their own aging, but it's not creaks and groans. You know, it's about... I'm so glad that I talked about this with my kids because I really learned it from, you know, watching maybe a grandparent who just seemed to be, I don't know, content maybe uh, with, with every stage of life. They found contentment and they found good. And so I'm just really trying to, you know, mimic that and be that kind of person as I age with my kids. Stories like that. But I... I specifically hunted down Maury. Like I was in the bushes and trying to to just, you know, pop a few more hints of going, we'll do this any time that works for you. Maury, have you had your morning breakfast? It is close to dinner time for us. Um, I've had my coffee. I, I'm I'm actually not very well today. I've 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 woken up yesterday quite unwell. Um, but I've got a, a, a very energetic spirit so i can i can push through, through a lot of things <laughs> you're pulling it um, off well Murray. as oh, spirit, you thank you i'm getting <laughs> off camera so i've had coffee i haven't really felt like having breakfast yet but um i'm not no. hankering but when i do i will be having toast with a smidgen of a eggplant cassendi paste and then i'll be having avocado with fresh tomato that's what i'll be having this morning that Thanks. sounds delicious avocado mm-hmm. toast is quite popular but the eggplant intrigues me okay judy i guess we're talking about food um any any particular food plans in your mind when he talks about that or or do you remember your last avocado toast (laughs) actually i don't think i do (laughs) if i'm in sandpoint um idaho i have avocado toast there's there's a really good organic cafe there that serves avocado toast but um sand point when I okay was, i'll keep that see, in mind when i was 19 and i married and moved to la 
there was an avocado tree in the backyard and oh. you could not escape that property. If you dropped by the front door, you got a grocery sack full of avocados because that thing was huge. It must have been oh. 70, 80 feet. You know, it was a very mature wow. avocado tree. So we handed out avocados in grocery sacks. So wow. I, I probably know more ways to eat avocado. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I, I worked at an avocado orchard uh, when I was traveling in North Queensland, you know, we're part of my, my hippie mecca around Australia. And yeah. um, I never got sick of avocados. There are never. so many things you can do with them. They're yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah. I, I love them. Cut it in half, take out the stone and eat both halves with lots of salt and pepper. And vine- well, we sometimes put balsamic vinegar and oh, and yes, vinegar. balsamic yeah. vinegar, yeah. Um, soda crackers, you're playing basic soda cracker oh. with lots of pepper and lots of, yeah, avocado smashed on it. Um, I love tico's, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Margemite, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this uh, this show today was brought to you by avocado. <laughs> right. By avocado growers on two continents. Yeah. Right. I wow. know. I was like, I was like, I can, I'm formulating a segue. Somehow <laughs> I know that I have seen posted recipes to do with your loved one in dementia, you know, things that where the participation is still there. And I could really see just, you know, slicing out, getting that stone out of the way and just participating together. There was there was actually a person that I served for a while. The the husband had heard of me word of mouth, and I was a hired caregiver, and said major stroke, just um, you know one side of the body brain digestive system no longer participates. Um, in and out of hallucinations, but completely wonderfully lucid. I loved my person. I loved, I loved mm-hmm. her. And but there just wasn't the hunger anymore. And that happens with aging too. I don't know that that's going to happen with me, but that can happen in aging where it's just like I only eat because I know I have to. I only eat because I'm supposed to. The bottle says ha- swallow these with a meal. Um, but I don't feel the hunger anymore. And so I would talk recipes with this person uh, and they told me the same <laughs> recipe each time. And we talked about grinding up the, the chips, the potato chips to sprinkle on top of this casserole. And as we talked, the food would go in. And I thought I found yeah. that part of the brain that is going, yes. So even though Dawn method in my mind, and do correct me, is primarily um, dementia focused. I think it would have, there's probably a lot in there that would have helped me and would have helped that husband in the case of just a major stroke. It's amazing that um, she survived and um, she was wonderful. I mean, she gave me marriage advice. She knew perfectly well she'd had a stroke. And then would begin into a, a hallucination with no stopping, no no change. Like the very next sentence had nothing to do with what was really going on. And I just thought, oh my goodness, I, I would wait for her to come back, but I would try to participate at her level. I was learning. I didn't know about the Dawn method, but uh, Maury, you said, oh, could, jo- get, could Judy come in too? And I'm going, Judy Cornish, <laughs> you know, it's like, can, can I have your autograph? <laughs> you want Maury's <laughs> autograph. <laughs> I, I have your autograph in, in your book. <laughs> I did. I sent books. Yeah, that's right. Oh no, you goodness. know, I think um, really the Don method is just um, what I mostly try to do is teach people to recognize cognitive skills. And, and so it doesn't matter whether you're working with somebody who's experiencing dementia. And, and there's a very specific pattern to which cognitive skills we lose when we experience dementia. Hmm. Um, but uh, one, of my, one of my employees um, left and, and moved to, to Washington and moved into a, um, a small town 
and began working with uh, children and adults on the autistic uh, spectrum. Yeah. And um, she said the very first afternoon she went to work with her first client. It was a 21 year old young man uh, who'd never hugged anybody, had never reached out or ever initiated physical contact. And uh, when she told him he had, she had to leave, he reached out and, and asked for a hug and gave her a hug. And, wow. and I think, you know, this is, it doesn't matter if I'm experiencing a left side stroke or, or dementia or, you know, I'm on the autism spectrum or whatever it is. We just need to look at each other as human beings and say and think, you know, which skills am I able to use? Which skills is this person able yeah. to use? And then, and then you just meet them where they are. And, and we do, people do that for us every day of our lives, right? Yes. They do. You yeah. know, I just, every day people uh, help me, like people, I'm, I'm always interacting with people who have better memory skills or better rational thinking skills or, you know, better attention skills. And I interact with people who have, you know, less, that are less adept in those areas. And I accommodate them, the other people accommodate me. That's just really what it means to be a gracious human being is accept people for what their skills are, what their strengths are and, and do your best, interact, be kind. I so, love that you said recognizing, yay, well, recognizing their cognitive, cognitive sk blah, skills, yeah. not not, oh, this is what they're losing or hang on to it because it's almost gone. You know, it isn't yeah. like, you know, what it sounds like it's not so much labeling and levels, but that is, doesn't help does, us. Does it. that still function? Can I, can I reach to that part of that person? I'm just thinking about a person who speaks fluently many languages and reverts to English, not their heart language, not what they grew up with for my sake, but right. doesn't dummy down to me, right. you know, like, Oh, she speaks yeah. only English, Ugh. you know? <laughs> right. So, you know, that Maury, I interrupted you cause I was so excited about that. <laughs> no, no, no. I, that, that's a, that's a really important point. I think, I think meeting people where they are is, I, I mean, I love that, that term, you know, it, it's been said by, many people over years, but you know, like how well do we do that? So I guess what I'm trying to do is always to focus on someone's abilities and strengths yeah. and play in that space, but right. yeah. also to do it on equal terms. Yeah. Um, it's really important for me to not, I mean, sometimes I do need to lead things. Sometimes initiation or being to initiate certain mm. things can, cannot, uh, might not be, part of a person's uh, abilities that they retain. But what I'm trying to do is uncover that or reveal that. And at some yeah. point, and, and this is where Judy was very influential on the way I thought, and you changed the way I thought a lot, Judy, when we spoke, you talked about rational thought and intuitive thought. And, yeah. and what I realized was, and you, mm -hmm. you pointed this out, was that I was playing in the intuitive space. And I, I kind of knew that intuitively, yeah. but I hadn't rationally yeah. realized it. <laughs> That's right. Um, and so that's that's really transformed the way I describe and think about what I do uh, when I, when I write about it. So yeah, and and you know, a great example. I don't know if you have seen that recent post I did with Laurel dancing. Laurel is the my elder buddy who passed away recently, wow. and I wrote about. It. And thank you, Christine, for for posting about that. But you see Laurel there about four four songs into old time music, and I'm trying to activate with music. So I don't use music all the time. But music is a great activator, and 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 as Oliver Sacks said, music activates all parts of your brain. There's so many components that it ignites, yeah. and so it activates people. But Laurel used to play the piano accordion, so music's really in her body. And you can see when I play with the tempo that she changes. She does big finishes, and yeah. pretty soon she's picking up social cues, comic cues, and right. emotional cues, and all those cues are still there. It's just how do I reveal them? or play with them or ignite them. And so I really, really began to think more about the intuitive space uh, more often and trying to drag people from, I, I think if we think about why people, I, sorry, I, I work with people that are rejecting social interaction. Yeah. People that are largely in their rooms and won't come out, don't want to participate. And there's a, there's 
millions of reasons why people might do that as a response to either going into aged care or whether it's dementia. And, and I think that I always think, and Judy, you might have an opinion on this. I always think of dementia as it's kind of could be an existential crisis, you know, like it's a crisis. Of, nothing makes sense in the way that it once did. So right. I'm trying to provide a sense of familiarity in my tone and my manner and my approach that I know you. And mm-hmm. they'll say, do I know you? And I say, I, I think I think we met a little while ago. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. And I sit in the same space as them. So I'm not telling them what they learn. And I think that that familiarity and that safety, it it moves them from the, the old part of our brain where the amygdala is in fight or flight in that defense mode and brings it to the forward part of the brain. And so other things are revealed. I don't know, Judy, what do you think about yeah, that moving from one, the old brain to the new brain? Yep, because what happens, and I'm, I'm probably grossly oversimplifying, and I hope I am, because I am not a neurologist and I intend not to be one until Aren't I get you? That's on your That's on your CV, isn't it, neurology? <laughs> yeah, I wish. But, um, okay, so in very simple terms, we have an amygdala, old brain. And my friend Priscilla reminded me early on, she said, Judy, never forget that the amygdala is screaming out, am I safe, four Mm. times a second from before birth until the moment you draw your last breath. It never stops. We're talking four times a second. Mm. Then, okay, so how does the human being ever cope with life? And the way we cope is we've got rational thinking skills. And what your rational thinking skills are doing is taking the very small amount of information that the corpus callosum allowed to pass from the intuitive thinking skills. Now, the intuitive thinking skills are inductive. That's your um, all the sensory information you run into. You, You don't have to work at it. It's whatever you can see, hear, taste, smell, touch. It's all coming in coming in. That's intuitive thinking skills, unfiltered, no no limit. Absolutely, induction, all of it's coming in from birth until death, actually before birth. Okay, so, so then the corpus callosum isn't allowing information to go to the rational thinking skills, it's slowing it down, it's preventing. Now it prevents because you don't want too much information hitting rational thinking because the rational thinking for us humans is what it does is it takes the small amount of information it's fed, organizes it, deduces, Mm -hmm. comparing and contrasting, seeing cause and effect, seeing sequencing, um, uh, prioritizing, deciding what's important. All your rational thinking skills are is a toolbox And it organizes information and answers the question four times a second and says, yep, amygdala, you're safe. A, B, C equals, yep, you're safe. Yeah, you're still safe. Uh Uh-huh, you're safe. So then what happens when somebody then begins to experience dementia? If it's something like Alzheimer's disease that causes, that's causing dementia, very likely the person is losing their, their memory skills first. Now, Alzheimer's disease, I think that's easy. The harder ones is when we're experiencing Mm -hmm. dementia and the type of dementia we're experiencing is causing us to lose rational thinking skills first. Now, that individual may have very good memory skills, but they aren't able to write the story, I am safe. And so you do get a lot Mm -hmm. of fight. fight. And it's not just fight or flight. There's four stress responses, fight, flight, freeze, On. Four, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Four, four Fs. The four Fs of stress. And and this is this is um mostly coming out of our, our latest research in social work. If you're now attending uh university to get a degree in social work, you're gonna be taught not fight and flight, but the four Fs of stress. Mm. Okay. What so, was the fourth one again? Fawn. And that's and what it, I heard you say. Yeah, fawn. Yeah. Okay, so fight is I'm you're going I'll to physically you demonstrate each one. You'd set them. Yeah, the, the fists are up. Now, flight means I'm out of here. No thought. It's just gone. Freeze is nothing. Everything shuts down. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Right. But fawn is kind of like um, Stockholm Syndrome. 
when and and which of these we flip into is going to depend upon um, earlier life experiences, personality, mm -hmm. and recent events, and how at risk we feel in the moment right now. So the person who has deduced their rational thinking has told them they have no chance of survival. That person will go into fawn and begin to try to uh, uh, cooperate with whoever the aggressor is to survive. And these, these are old, you're right, this is old brain stuff. But, you know, the, so, so when I begin to lose, let's say I'm experiencing dementia that's the result of FTD or um, maybe a traumatic brain injury, a, a bad reaction to an anesthetic, um, uh, Korsakoff syndrome, cardiovascular disease, any of these, I am most likely to lose rational thinking skills at least as quickly or sooner than my memory skills. Now, I'm, that means I'm less likely to get diagnosed soon. And that means mm -hmm. I'm going to be exhibiting the greatest amount of my natural four Fs of stress, my stress reactions. And, and part of the things that one of the key things that we lose when we lose our rational thinking skills is that word that, that Maury said, he said, I initiate. Mm -hmm. What does it take to initiate? So let's think about it. I'm, I'm, you know, let's say I've begun to experience dementia. Um, my husband wasn't able to care for me at home. The years have passed. And, and for whatever reason, I need to go live in a care facility. So um, there I am. And Maury hasn't arrived yet. I'm sitting in my room. And think about it. There's things that over my life, lifetime I have devised that I like to do. And this is my self-care. Let's say um, when the going gets rough, I get a cup of tea, right? You know, I'm Canadian. Okay, so if, if anything, you need a little bit of time, you gotta think something out, it's difficult. I'm gonna get myself a nice hot cup of tea. Or maybe a person likes a hot bath, or maybe a person likes to take a walk. When they start feeling stressed, they go for a walk. You know, we all have these activities that, that are self-care. Now, if I'm experiencing dementia, if I've lost my memory skills, the day comes when I no longer recall not only how to make a cup of tea for myself, but also that I even like it. Yeah. yeah. I remember the day one of my clients forgot that every night before bed, she took a hot bath. And that was how she settled down. And that's how she would be relaxed and sleep well. <laughs> And the day she forgot, we had to take over initiating. But initiation itself takes rational thinking. You have to be able to be sitting. I be, Here I am. I'm sitting in my room. Maury hasn't come yet. And I'm sitting there thinking, I just don't belong here. I, You know, nothing looks familiar. I, I don't recall how I arrived here. It's really scary. When I tried to leave, oh. everybody got mad at me. So I'm just not going to leave the room. I'm going to stay put. Yeah. Now, what am I going to do? Well, I can't plan because I've lost my rational thinking skills. I mm. can't anticipate. Yeah. I can't see sequencing. I can't say to myself, okay, I feel at risk. I don't feel at home. Oh, I know. In the drawer over there, I have my favorite book my little devotional right. work and I'm going to just stand up right now, go over there, get my devotional out of the bedside table. And then I'm going to go over there and sit down in that easy chair and I'm going to read my devotional and I'll feel better. I can't do that because I have lost the ability to sequence or to see cause and effect. Cause and effect. Yeah. I mean, that's just such a picture. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine having to live life without the ability to say, if I do this, then I'll feel better. And yet at the same time, the amygdala never stops screaming. Am I safe? Four times every second that carries on. So this is, this is why Corey's work is so important. You know, you are, you're initiating people and, and what you do, you're, you're bringing the, um, Things that, you see, you've got to think about rational thinking. Think about rational thinking, to those skills, what that lets, lets us do. Let's see, if I've got rational thinking and memory skills, 
I, I make an excellent employee, right? I can be really mm. productive. You tell me what you want, I'll remember it. I'll, I'll use my rational thinking skills and deduce the quickest, best way to do it. And then I'll do it over or I'll be really productive. Or I'll use software and I'll get really good at solving problems for my employer. Or, you know, all of these, all of these activities of being a good employee and productive are based on are, are rational thinking skills. I'm going to lose those to dementia. But what do I keep? What's, what is my intuitive thinking? That's my ability to, with no effort at all, receive mm. all sensory yeah. stimuli around me. All right, can I initiate it? Can I go get it? Can I find it, plan on getting it later? Think about how to go there? No, I can't. I can't do any of that. But I am fully equipped to enjoy anything beautiful you bring to me. There, here I am. You say you love me? You're my, my, my spouse, my children, my friends. You, you work in dementia care and your job is to provide dementia care. I can't do it for myself. I'm fully equipped to enjoy everything. Mm -hmm. in the world. Beauty, companionship, positive emotions, all of that. I haven't lost any of that. <laughs> That's what? what I could see in the movie, the Laurel, um, I guess it was a, a documentary or a, a short segment, whatever it was that you showed was yeah. that she was giving back to you. She mm. was letting you know, oh, yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. I can tell you that that minor chord is about to resolve yeah. and, yeah. you know, and she whoosh. You know, it's like you and I, and without her saying it, it's like you and I are on the same stage. Attunement, we, I think, is the word that other. I like to use. Yeah. Attunement. Attunement. Doesn't we take are, English. We were completely in language. <laughs> Say again? We don't need verbal language. <laughs> I, I, I know. I, it's funny because everything I do is so instinctive, and then to go and write about it is a whole other thing. But I'm trying to... <laughs> trying to illuminate for others what yeah. I'm doing and how, like, it's really actually quite easy. Um, I, I mean, I think that that the what, what you said about Laurel, so what happened was was that Paul, Laurel's son Paul, used to come and film us together um, because I, I would use music. I mean, you know, you talked about joy and, and being able to experience you know, it, it, things intuitively. Music, music for some people isn't really important, you know, but the ukulele is a very small, bright instrument. It's not a barrier. It's very small and it's, it has mm -hmm. a lovely tune. Well, it depends on how it's played. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I think when I come into a room, I use music to activate. I don't, I don't try and base everything around music. However, Laurel is very much a music driven intervention. However, I'm testing her when I hit the minor chord, um, when it's resolving her, t I'm changing the tempos of songs. I'm throwing in, um, you know, bup, bada, bup, bups, and she'll respond to those. I lean in and she leans in with me. Yeah. And so I think it starts because when you go in and you strum and you sing a song, that person, their amygdala, their, I guess, if they're sitting in loneliness or grief, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it's grief a lot, is that there's the protective shield is up. The amygdala is ready to go and they've had the experience of being yelled at for trying to leave. They don't yeah. know what to do. They can't yeah. move. They're, they're frozen. Someone comes in with the ukulele and starts playing and smiles and says, hello, Laurel. You yeah. feel, oh, you feel safe. And then you feel joy. And pretty soon you're on that, that treadmill. So, so yeah, it, it was filmed by Laurel's son. I've got about 40 minutes of footage with Laurel playing a game called cricket, we call. It's, it's, our, it's not like baseball, but you use a bat and you hit the ball. And I was so worried she was going to belt me with it, but only because she didn't understand it in space. But yeah. um, with, with lots of uh, lots of music and her following me down the hallway saying, where's the boy? Um, and so I gave that footage to a, 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 an advocacy group here called the Older Persons Advocacy Network, OPAN. They wanted to have some footage of my window therapy stuff that I was doing during COVID, but at that stage I didn't have any. So I gave him 10 minutes of footage with Paul's blessing because he just wants everyone, Paul wants everyone to do what I'm doing. He wants more of that for his for people, for elders. Mm -hmm. And they edited that down to that beautiful two-minute 
clip and it really does capture what happened in that session um yeah it's it's a beautiful i'm very lucky to have that footage i think we're blessed to be able to see you know the work between two people and i know it's it's me um but i think that there's a lot of people that are doing really good stuff and the hardest thing to do in aged care is to get footage and to be allowed to film and to use it i mean there's a lot of a lot of boxes to check. Boy, so I've I, been very, very lucky that my my six partner sites give me uh, this great trust in taking photographs, and that I will follow the procedures in getting the permissions from everybody before I I use them. Yeah, there's every two things. My, I, go ahead. Every one of my staff, when I was writing my books, all of my staff wanted me to use their names. So, you know, yeah. there's Heike and Sarah, and, and that, those are their real names. Not one of my clients' families would allow me to even dedicate the book to, to even to a client with their first name, you know. And, and there's some really dear clients who every, everything I've written about came from my clients. Mm. You know, really, those are their books. The Dawn Method is theirs. And yet, yeah, right. Was stigma, I wasn't allowed to even use their first names. So... Yeah, yeah, I wish I could have. But. Yeah. I do try and ask people when I do get permission. So you're going to say something, Christine, but I do try and get permission to name. Sometimes I'll use initials, but it's really yeah. nice if you name. Yeah. Like I, I read Laurel, Baz. I'm about writing about Baz at the moment. Um, they like to him to be called Baz instead of Barry. It's a very Australian thing. Um, huh. But I did interrupt you, Christine. You wanted to say something. Well, I just, I mean, it went into a different direction for me, what you were just saying, because I try really hard. I will say gender, but I try really hard not to give any indicator. People know generally geographically where I am, but not to give any indicators of who that person was. But, oh, you know, I want to tell them all about that person and the situation. Every time I listen to you, I think of those people. And when people are going to be listening to this, because I'm always posting out. In fact, I received a message this morning from a person who lives just a few miles away saying, what do you have? Give me your website again. I just talked to a person who's um, just at wit's end with their own grandparents. And I'm so grateful because this will be another one where I will say, I will go, dang, I remember when Judy and Maury were on the same screen and that was the topic. And I'll be able to send that out to someone. No one has time to scroll through every single episode yeah. of anybody's anything, but to be able to send one thing and go, even if you just go to the middle of it and, and listen on, just uh, resources, links, mm -hmm. you know, contact information, something that sounds familiar going, I didn't know because we don't go running out in the streets with big signs saying, today, my loved one thought they were on fire or last night, they woke me up and started talking about things that are, I didn't know if it was a hallucination. I didn't know if I medicated them incorrectly. I didn't know if they bumped their head, you know, and you know, that's how the night went. We don't do that. We keep privacy. And we also are kind of feeling like I, I don't want other people to know what I'm dealing with. I want to kind yeah. of have my normal side mm -hmm. or I don't want someone to criticize. They think you're not doing it right or whatever. The two things I wanted to make sure about was that I tell people who are listening to this in replay that Maury took, I don't have one, but it's the sort of thing that you'd buy at the store to write on the side of your van windows, we're going to state or, you know, champion this or just married or whatever it might be. Maury took that and he drew a circle and then just a space away, he drew another circle on a window, the window of a uh, what I call the hallways, the places where there are rooms after rooms with people yeah. who are being looked after and kept safe. He, he made a little nose bridge in between. I think there might have been earpieces sticking out. That would be up to the creativity of the person. They could mm -hmm. even add a nose and a little mustache if they'd like. And then he came right into it. And 
interacted with a person, perhaps they remembered him, possibly they did not, but there wasn't anything frightening about a head tilting back and forth and putting the eyes there. And here came the intuitive mimicking, putting the eyes up there too. For someone who's like, they don't even know who I am anymore. I've been there. It was many decades ago where I thought, why even go visit? I, we, it's like we don't exist or all, all that happens is maybe some kicking from the wheelchair or something. I didn't have the skills. I didn't have the training. I, I didn't have um, maturity to go, no. wait a minute, there might be a way. <laughs> but Christine, you know what it is. We don't have the skills. We don't have the training, but we don't have the knowledge. In the United States, not in we Ford. have separated. The, the generations live apart. I think every time I talk to a family, if I have two siblings you know, on Zoom or in the, in the office, it takes less than 20 minutes before at least one of them says, yeah, but she's old. He's old. So shouldn't she be in a senior care community? And the answer is no. They ought to be in a family. <laughs> Your family, yeah. their family, you know, that's where we should be. You know, the question, and so I, I've got, so I'd say back to people, do you have children at home? Well, that's a six-year-old. Shouldn't your six-year-old be with other six-year-olds in some kind of a community for six-year-olds? Our children shouldn't be in their families. They should be in institutions for children, right? Because then you can keep them safe. And, uh, you know, this doesn't make sense. You say it about right. children, it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. You know, the Brits did that for a couple hundred years, and it doesn't work well. <laughs> you take your children. What's that called? Them. You're sending them away to a boarding school. Right. There we go. You know, Where everything is at their level. And yeah. they're all professionals, so they'll take care. Now, right. I'm I'm on both sides as far as where where does your person need to be, or where do I feel that I need to be? Yeah. You know, in in a situation, maybe projecting in the future, or maybe if I'm able to rationally think through what's going on with me. Here like we a, sit, yeah, in you America, know, in America, yeah. and yeah. we're trying to talk to talk ourselves talk to ourselves about whether it's appropriate or not for older people to live in senior communities. And, you know, this wasn't something that humans talked about for until, until recently. Yeah. It's, 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 it. And there's a number of cultures, most cultures, you know, here in the U S this is the culture. It's the great 200 year experiment of having the individual be primary over family. This is the first, you know, you look at other cultures and you look at other countries and they teach the children that children have a duty to the family. And, and here in America, we talk about pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, a tough love, right? Independence. We celebrate independence. We're all about the individual. And, and it's, a, it's an experiment. It's not what, what has been common in human history. The family is common in human history. And, you know, right now I'm, I'm talking with people in, in Singapore. And a whole yeah. lot of the work I have built into the courses of the Dawn Method are completely inappropriate. It's, it's a given. Well, of yeah, course, right. it's my parents. Of course, my parents are living with me. If somebody becomes ill enough that they must go live in a mm. hospital or have rehab care, well, then we're going to work as a family and make it happen. We will make sure we can do it if we possibly can. But that's not considered normal for mm. people who are your elders. What's normal is, in other cultures, is that we're a family. Some of us are children. Some of us are adults. Some of us are elders. And, uh, you know, if I'm an adult, I'm going to look after the children. I'm going to look after the elders. I'm going to look after whoever needs looking after. And, and here in America, we've, we don't get the opportunity to learn how. And, and so we're at a loss and, and we feel badly because mm -hmm. we don't recognize what, what people need. And, and you can't, I, you know, I kind of feel a lot of times I'll say to families, don't feel guilty. 
we just, you know, birth. How many of us could step up to the plate and help somebody give birth? Not many of us, because birth became medical. How many of us could step up to the plate and help somebody live the last few days of life? Hmm. Not many of us, because that's become medical in this country. And, and you know, Australia, I'll let you speak to that, Maury, but, but we've lost touch with the beginning of life and the end of life. Yeah. And having done mm. so, we we don't know how to support our elders. And you know the thing that breaks my heart the most. And I'm sorry, I'm doing too much talking. You guys have to override me. But here's the deal. I it just breaks my heart when I hear somebody say, um, you know, my mom ex- is experiencing dementia and it's the long goodbye. And you know, it's, I, I'm, uh. I mean, she's dying to me twice. And I go to see her, and she doesn't even know who I am. Mm. And I feel like saying. Okay, we know that. We know if your parent or your loved one is experiencing dementia, we know that if they don't lose those memory skills at the beginning, they will during the journey. They're going to lose their memory skills. Now, did you? Have you lost your memory skills? No. Mm-hmm. All right. As you walk the journey together, your, your loved one is going to begin to repeat things. Because if they're, you know, they're losing their memory, what are they going to repeat? They will repeat what is the most important to them. So you're going to hear some stories over over and over again. And every one of us has some life experiences and some relationships that have shaped us. And there are stories that we will begin to tell repeatedly because those stories tell us and our companions, our loved ones, who we are. So when my clients started to lose their memory skills and become more and more forgetful, and they started to repeat things, I am listening and I am using the opportunity to memorize. I memorize my clients' stories and I memorize their stories with their words and their phrases because spoken language comes from music, not from thought, it comes from music. Mm-hmm. And and music, the melody that is that, you know, to listen to a melody activates many parts of the brain, but to listen to a familiar phrase does the same. Yes, now, absolutely. My clients, yeah. So my clients, they're gonna tell me stuff over and over and over again. It doesn't bother me at all because I need practice. It's gonna take me a while to memorize their stories and their words. And then when they don't know them anymore, I become the memory keeper. I become the storyteller. So as you know, like I'll never forget the first, I have one of my clients and I would have loved to dedicate my book to her in her name very specifically. But um, we spent eight years together. And I don't have a close family. I, I never knew my grandparents or aunts or uncles. I you know, I, I barely knew my parents. And and so where I spent eight years with her and she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's oh, I, I, a decade before I met her. She was very forgetful when we began to spend time together. But the last few months of her life, I, I remember going to the adult family home where she was living. And I, I walked in, there's a new caregiver. And she says, who are you here to see? And I said, oh, I'm here to see Mary. I know the way. And she says, what, Mary? <laughs> That's a waste of time. She hasn't spoken, she hasn't spoken in a week. She won't know who you are. And I said, That's okay. I know who I am and I know who she is. And she's like, Oh, you should come see some of these other clients. They're really lonely. They'd appreciate some, you know, but Mary, she she's not even gonna open her eyes. She's in fetal mm. position, she doesn't eat, you know, really it's a waste of time. Mm. And I went into Mary's room and I got a chair and I pulled the chair up so that I could see Mary's face. And if she were to open her eyes, she would see mine. And I didn't touch her because she doesn't know who I am. And, and if she doesn't know who I am, how dare I touch her, reach out and touch her. But I sat down where she can see me and I said, Mary, Mary is Judy. I'm your dear friend, Judy. You and me, we love each other. 
Oh, let me tell you. Let's see. We got to know each other eight years ago. It was a little more than eight years ago. Oh, you were out watering your tomatoes. I, I came across the street and I started to tell her our memories. And after a minute or two, one eye opened and she kind of looked at me like she couldn't believe what she heard. And I stayed there and over a period of about a half an hour, I went from our stories to her stories. And I said, Mary, you know, that you told me all about meeting your husband. Oh, it was wonderful. You told me. And then I started telling her her stories. I told her about her children, her husband, her church, mm. her life. <clears throat> By the time I had to leave after half an hour, she had been laughing, smiling. She was holding my hands. She puckered up for a kiss before I left. When, when we lose the ability through losing rational thinking skills, we lose the ability to use language, verbal language, not nonverbal, verbal. We lose the ability to initiate activities on our own. We lose our memory skills. We lose knowledge of who we were, everything that, that we just assume is available to know forever. All of that goes. But our ability to receive never goes. And if you love somebody who's experiencing dementia and you don't use your memory skills on their behalf and become their storyteller, their memory keeper, you will lose them, but they will lose themselves as well. Yeah, oh, my God. That is, uh, right? yeah, you know. It, the onus is on us. The, the mm. power yeah. you know, and the power of yeah. the familiar when you yeah. ignite because yeah. you yeah. know let's face it people ignite. yeah living in that space yeah. and, and not surrounded by it, there's nothing that's familiar anymore right. you know it's yeah. not their home it's a room full of strangers when they go to meals yeah. and then you come in with something familiar and you start talking about tomatoes the tomatoes yeah. Yeah. um yeah. straight away you know yeah. the familiar and i think that that's that's certainly what i'm trying to ignite and, and music is part of that but yeah. also, you know, I use lots of different tools to 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 get there. But you um, know, Mary, the thing you do so beautifully, life does not need to be all serious. There is no reason no. <laughs> why we can't have fun. And mutual how- mischief is what I call it, Judy. I try to create opportunities <laughs> for mutual mischief if it's appropriate. Yeah. Most yeah. people do want a bit of mischief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, there's no reason to not have fun. And yeah. and this whole thing of having care facilities that came out of the 1920s, and, you know, nursing home, it started as boarding houses when, you know, families were breaking down and we had tremendous economic um, stress. And, mm-hmm. and people would just take in boarders and, and a lot of people who were elderly ended up on the street. And so you ended up with elderly boarders who needed support and care and it became Mm. nursing homes and somehow somehow we ended up in this habit habitual assumption that if you're other than the quote unquote normal then you're sick if you're sick you need to be in a hospital if you're in a hospital no fun everybody's got to be really careful Mm. <laughs> You've got to be really serious, and there, you know, a lot of risk out there. A lot of risk. Yeah. Wow. Why is it only fun at children's hospitals? Well, that's exactly. Because you catch <laughs> <laughs> well, they they need to still have a chance to be children, and I'm like, I'm trying to figure out the age where you're not supposed to. <laughs> No, when he's going to have fun and distractions. Yeah. My, my oh, is my meant goodness. to go throughout our entire entire life, you know, and it's. Yeah. You know, and I think the greatest, for me, one of the forms that I like the most and just thinking about, you're talking about familiar phrases, is banter. So for my father, as my father father rapidly progressed down the path of, of vascular dementia, um, yeah. he was what we call, I don't, I don't use the term wandering, but people would be familiar with that. I use the term searching. Uh, he was yeah. searching for familiarity, I think, yeah. searching for comfort. I would walk with him and I, he was a storyteller. So he was known for saying, you'd say, where are you going, Dad? And he'd say, pretty good, thanks. <laughs> Dad, where are you going? Up on the roof to mow the lawn. So I would recount yeah. those phrases with him as we walked. I would tell the stories. We had a pet turkey when we were kids called Din Din. Now, Din Din is obviously short for dinner. dinner. <laughs> yeah, we didn't know yeah. when he named our pet turkey Din Din that that's what was going to happen. And... 
Din Din went missing. We came home and the gate was open and Din Din was gone. The dog was there. The cats with the turtle was there. The chickens were there, but Din Din had escaped. So we put signs around. Years later, I'm about 17 years old. We find out Din from Din. my father at the table what happened to Din Din. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm Maury Jr., right? I'm known as Little Maury. That's that's been my name. So dad it says, well, what was, I said, what happened to Din Din? He said, well, what was his name? And I literally went, Din Din, no, no, you didn't. <laughs> he fed Din Din to us as kids one Christmas in probably, I don't know, it was 1968 or something, 67. So I said, where did, where did you do that? And I asked all these questions and he did it down at Fred Keating's place, two doors down. So I, get, I got up and dad said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to see Fred Keating. And I knock on the door, Fred Keating opens it. I get a young, young Maury, how are you? I said, I've got a bone to pick with you. And he hung his head and he said, I intended. Come. He knew, <laughs> he knew that one day I would confront him about cooking our turkey. So that story is a family anecdote. It lives yes, on in our family lovely. to the point where yes. don't give Poppy your pets because he'll feed them to you. So when my father walked and was looking for familiarity, I would talk to him about Din Din yes. the turkey and he would yes. stop and he'd say, Oh, yes. he looked up at me. I said, Don't describe yes. it to me, Dad. Yes. Yeah. I would walk and I would talk about my, whatever happened to Maria Brown. Now, Maria Brown was the woman that broke his heart when he was a young man. Oh. And we would talk about the stories. Yeah. And as yeah. you said, Judy, using his phrases, using his yeah. stories, yeah. I was just recounting the stories he sat on the end of the bed. Dad never read one story to us from a book in his life. Instead, he told us stories about growing up on a farm with 12 kids, um, you know, oh. losing his father age three and what he used to do on the farm. Wow. So my dad was a storyteller. And that's probably where I get my love for oral history yeah. and oral traditions yeah. from. You uh, well, it definitely is. Yeah. But and so, Judy, it's really interesting that you talk about that familiarity and the musicality of language, and that's the phraseology yeah. of it. And it, it's a pattern. And I think that one of the things yeah. that we do see when we with someone that's experiencing dementia, they lose the ability to initiate. But if they were a dancer, and if you oh, pick yeah. them up and you hold oh, them in a position and you move, oh bang, yeah. Yeah, they're off. Right People can't right. talk, but they can sing. It's yeah. a pattern yes. and it's a joyful pattern. It is. Judy, yeah. I'm going to say what I should have said. I'm going to ask each of you to give your contact information because it's wonderful to hear all this. But if somebody wants more and they want to know more about you. So my big announcement is that I am putting on and it's, it's on the ticker at the bottom of the screen. I'm putting on an in-person event in about three months. I don't know how close you can get with this, but I'm calling it Convergence and it's in October. And the reason why I'm doing it is that my husband said, you should have a conference. Okay. And as I've, as I've talked to people about it each time, their endorphins go up and they're like, oh, you should have so-and-so. Oh, I could come and do this. So I'm doing it right here in Independence, and you're not too very far away, Judy. Um, <laughs> Maury, I can't do that. To, I can't do that to you. The jet lag alone would do you in. But um, it it's just an opportunity for people to come together. There's more, and there's going to be more on the website, which is convergence dash experience dot. That's my little plug right there. Convergence dash experience. Uh, yeah. Convergence dash experience dot com. Um, Maury, what about you? When people want to see some of those videos or um, they want to get in contact with you, where should they go? I, I, um, I deal pretty much through LinkedIn. Um, there are contact details there, but you have to unearth them to get closer <laughs> to me. Um, what I might do, though, um, that clip of Laurel is available on Vimo. I might send you that link. Um, Good. I'll post it when it. I and send it. And you can actually out. download it. So, um, yeah, and if people like to use it or look at it or analyse it, that, that that's what it's there for to, you know, like to share. So pretty much contact me via LinkedIn. I'm active on it a lot. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can get me through there. And I've got posts and things I've I've written. I try to write original content you know, as much as I can and share the stories. I've got one coming out next week. Um, it's it's a little bit about um, involving families, staff and the elders in a bit of mischief. Um, and that features Baz. 
And also I've got, um, I think maybe you both have helped vote for me. I, uh, next week, find out if um about the Golden Pineapple Awards. Yeah. Um, I've been nominated, for those yeah. who don't know, as Person of the Year um, for my work uh, wow. in diversity, inclusion and equity. Mm-hmm. And I'm the only and- person in seven categories from aged care. So it's an important advocacy wow. role. That is- so the whole dementia, loneliness, isolation category, you're like the only one in that category. There's a lot of other categories that you would think of, but... It- yeah. I think he should win. <laughs> oh, well, you know, oh, yeah. there's the thing about it is that everyone should win because all the people that have been nominated oh, do yeah. exceptionally big-hearted mm. work, you know, and that just mm. being nominated and standing alongside those people is a win already. Yeah. Um, but having said yeah. that, there there is no one from aged care represented in the diversity inclusion. I mean, you know, we focus a lot on gender, on race, religion, we, we and we need to to do that. But but our elders, we we're not doing mm-hmm. enough. Yeah. <laughs> Society yeah, and elders, talking about it's and you're talking everything. about everything. It's we're all those categories enough. together. We got to do better. Mm-hmm. They're our elders. They're here. Yeah. We are. They are here for us to learn from. They hold mm-hmm. our history, our knowledge, how we got here, why we interpret things the way we do, yeah. and that's why I use the term mm-hmm. elder. You know, because they are us they then. Yeah. We're all elders in the making, as a good friend of mine says. Elders in the making. Very good. Nicole Smith says that. (laughs) She's someone you should talk to. But anyway, how do you contact Judy? Yeah, that's it. Uh, Okay. Well, I'm on LinkedIn, but um, the Dawn Method website. So it's um, the Dawn Method. Dawn is D-A-W-N, and it stands for Dementia and Alzheimer's Wellbeing Network. But um, actually, you can probably just, I, it used to be you could Google Judy and dementia and I came up, but I don't know. I haven't checked. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, the Dawn Method is, it's, um, everything's on the website there. We've got training for families as well as Good. for professionals. Um, I actually do a lot more work outside of the United States than I do in. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yes, you were mentioning Singapore. You know what? Yeah. Um, I'm off to a baseball game with the family. Yeah. Can see that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, you know, I guess, I guess we need to know what things. If if one day I come in at you with the ukulele and you're sitting in a a strange room, do I talk baseball to you? Is that what I do? No, definitely singing. In fact, I I did a a thing like a year and a half ago of what would be my favorite things if I was in a community, if I was placed or placed myself into a community that would provide for my needs, what had to be there? And that was just an open-ended question. And my own answer included karaoke. I have never participated in karaoke. But boy, do I love to feel like I'm up on a stage and and feel like, you know, I'm I'm all in there with a crowd of people and we're all going to sing the last verse of the song together. I probably would do very well in uh, public houses or pubs, you know, kind of a thing. (laughs) One more round. I don't play any instruments at all, but I definitely love to sing along. So. That's you. You can come at, at me that way. And I used to be a school teacher, so you could you could play along with me ready? on my school teacher talk. <gasps> Ooh, <laughs> hey, sing us out. You're ready. Sing us out. That'll be the end. There we are. Oh, we ain't got a barrel of money. Maybe ragged and funny, but we'll travel along, singing a song, song. side song. by side. <laughs> I 